I am excited about our upcoming lectureship. I hope that you are as well. I look forward to an in-depth study of the prodigal son. I hope that no stone will be left unturned, that we'll discover some things that we have missed uh, in our prior readings and studies of this great parable. I do not know of a parable that is more needed uh, than this parable is today. As Chris prayed, there are so many who are no longer faithful to Christ, who are in the far country, or who may be in this building, but in their minds and because of their attitudes, they're in the far country and are in need of reclaiming. And so I look forward to the study that we will have together. There will be a number of topical lessons. There will be a number of lessons that deal with topical matters, uh, such as moral issues, and I think that will be good for us as well. And so we encourage everyone to mark that date on your calendars, uh, July the 24th through the 28th, and to be present for as many of those lessons as you possibly uh, can be. This morning we want to introduce uh, the parable of the prodigal son to go ahead and get you thinking about it so that when the lectureship takes place you have a foundation upon which to build. I have asked the speakers that come in not to retell the story. If they each retell the story, uh, then it will be told some 35 to 36 times. And we don't need that. But we do need them to deal with the individual aspects of the story so that we can get deeper into this parable and understand it better. I'm convinced that so often we as Christians say on the surface, we have an occasional sermon on a parable where we really never have time, we never get into the depth to see the great lessons that are there. And so I hope uh, that we'll be able to do that. The prodigal son, a young man who came to himself and came home to his father. The parable of the prodigal son is the longest parable that Jesus ever told. And yet it is but 22 verses in length. When Jesus told stories, he did not tell long stories. His stories were rather short and to the point. But yet we can talk about them and we can think about them and we never will exhaust them in spite of the fact that they were not very lengthy in nature. Not only was the parable of the prodigal son perhaps the longest parable, was the longest parable that Jesus ever told, it is also likely the most loved parable that Jesus ever told. I am convinced that it at least attains to the chief three. I do not consider any parable to be greater than this parable, but there are other parables, of course, that often get mentioned, like the parable of the Good Samaritan, or maybe the parable of the sower. But certainly this parable ranks very high in the minds of individuals who know about the parables of Jesus. Charles Dickens wrote of this parable that it was the greatest story, greatest short story ever told. And it would be hard to argue with that estimate of this parable. As we take a look at this parable, we want to consider three points. We want to consider them all this morning. We'll have to do so as well tonight. But we want to talk about, first of all, the rebellion of the prodigal son. And then we want to see the regret of the prodigal son. And finally, we want to see the restoration of the prodigal son. And if we have a goal for our lectureship, our goal is that it might lead to the restoration of some souls. We need to be praying, as Chris did this morning, to that end. We need to be working toward that end. There are a number of individuals that used to be faithful in this congregation who are no longer faithful. We need to make sure that we give them an invitation to this, this lectureship so that they can come and hear lessons, hopefully that will stir something within them and cause them to want to be faithful to Christ again. We also need to invite those who have children who are unfaithful, those who have mates who are unfaithful, or those who in some other way are battling this type of an issue because I think these lessons will be encouraging to them and helping them to understand the great love that the Father has for the lost. And I hope that we will take advantage of this and invite them to be a part of this lectureship. In Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 11, we find that a certain man had two sons. A certain man. I think that's interesting. 
We know that the parables were about things that could happen. Many times, I'm convinced they were about things that had happened. That's very likely the case with this parable. Obviously, we know today that there are fathers who have prodigal sons. It is not that far of a stretch in our minds to consider the fact that the same thing likely took place in Jesus' day. And so this was something that could happen and perhaps something that had happened. I think it's interesting that Jesus said a certain man had two sons. He did not merely say a man had two sons. Generally speaking, when the Bible refers to a certain man, a certain man is in mind. An individual who has a name, an individual whose story many people knew. Perhaps that was the case here. We're told by some commentators that there was a story that was told among the rabbis that was very much likened to this story. A man who had two sons, one of them goes into the far country. But there was a great difference between the story told by the rabbis and the story that Jesus told. The story that's told by the rabbis had the son coming home and facing the condemnation and the wrath, wrath of his father. Jesus didn't tell a story like that. No, this son comes home and finds the compassion of his father. This story was very different from what the Pharisees expected, but it was what they needed. Which story do you like best? The story of the son that comes home and is condemned by his father or the story of the son that comes home and is received with compassion by his father? Well, any of us who have ever been in the role of the prodigal son, and that is all of us, I think we like the story that Jesus told far better than the story that the rabbis told. We want that father to be our father. We want to find that when we come home. So we want to examine this portion of our study today as we talk about the rebellion of the prodigal son. Let's begin looking at the context. We'll begin in verse 12, and we'll see the prodigal's demand. The prodigal's demand. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me, and he divided unto them his living. The younger of them. There were two sons, an older and a younger, and it is the younger that comes to his father. Notice that it is the son that comes to the father and not the father that comes to the son. It is the son that comes to the father and says, Give me my inheritance. It is not the father that comes to the son that says, Son, I want to go ahead and give you what one day will be yours. There would have been no shame in the father coming to the son, but there was great shame in the son coming to the father. You see, it was the father's prerogative to divide his goods at any time that he wanted to. And legally speaking, he could do so. Now, legally speaking, at the time that he divided the goods, the son would take possession of the property and of the stock. But it would be open to the father's use until the father died. The father ultimately remained in control, even though the property was already given out to the sons. The father could use it as long as he wanted to, as long as he lived. He just went ahead and made sure that it was divided the way that he wanted it divided. That evidently was the case here. We're going to see that when the prodigal son comes home, that the father is going to give him certain things. That property had already been given to the elder son, and yet the father, at his discretion, gives part of it to the younger son. Legally, the father was justified in doing that. But we see the prodigal's demand. We see that the, the younger son comes to his father, and he says to his father, Give me. We probably do not capture this in the English as well as it is in the Greek. It is a very forceful statement that the prodigal is making to the father. It is not merely a request, it is a demand. You see, this younger son is tired of waiting on his father to die. He sees all of this, he knows a portion of it will be his, and he just simply cannot wait on his father to get sick and for his father to die. And so he comes to his father, and it's as if he says to his father, I wish you'd go ahead and die. I wish you'd go ahead and get out of the way so that I could take possession of this. 
He comes and he makes a demand of his father. His father can see in his son's eyes that his son is determined to do this. He knows there's no stopping him. He knows there's no preventing him. And the father goes ahead and divides his goods and gives to his son. And yet he knows what this means to him. When it says that the father divided his living, divided unto them his living in verse 12, it means literally that he divided unto them his life. The Greek there is the word bios. It is the idea of life. The father literally gave them his life. He literally took his life and he said, this is your portion and here's your portion of my life. He gave his life to them. He gave all that he had worked for. He gave all that he had sweated for. He gave every bit of what he had to them. It became theirs to do with as they saw fit. And we know, of course, what this younger son will do with what he is given. Now, when we think about what was given to this young man, we have to believe that the inheritance was rather substantial. When we read this parable, we come to the impression that this father was a very wealthy man. In fact, in the parable, the son will talk about hired servants. Poor families did not have hired servants. This man does. And in fact, the prodigal is going to say, how many of my father's hired servants? And so his father not only had hired servants, but he had many hired servants. We know as well that this father had a fancy robe that he could give to his son. We know that this father had a ring that he could place on his son's finger. We know that this father had a fatted calf just waiting for a grand occasion. And John MacArthur notes that poor families didn't have a fatted calf waiting for some grand occasion. Only the very, very wealthy had those kinds of resources. That was the kind of family that this young man had. And his inheritance must have been substantial. Now we know based upon Deuteronomy chapter 21 the way that things were divided. We know that the eldest son received a double portion. And depending upon how many sons there were, things were divided in accordance with that. But the eldest son always got a double portion. This son was the younger son, which means that his brother got two-thirds and he got one-third as things were divided out. And yet one-third of this father's property still would have been much, much, much wealth. And from what we can gather from this parable, the young man was not interested in his father's property. He was not interested in his father's livestock. For he had in no intentions of staying on this property. He had no intentions of tending to those sheep. No, he wanted what that property and those sheep represented. He wanted cash. He wanted cash so that he could hit the road and so that he could make his journey into the far country. And so in all likelihood, this young man, as quickly as he could, liquidated these possessions. He sold or rented out the property. He sold or, or, or somehow got the money for the livestock. Then he took that cash and he headed for the far country. No doubt he got pennies on the dollar for what he did. He was having an emergency moving cell. And he had to take whatever he could get to fund this journey. And he was more than willing to do that, which shows just how much he wanted out from under his father. Now, when we think about this young man, this young man not only wanted to be out from under his father's control, he wanted to be out from under his father's sight. He did not even want his father to know what he was doing. He could have taken, of course, a residence just down the road. He would have been out from under his father. That was not far enough. He wanted to be away from his father's sight. And so ultimately he's going to go to the far country. So first of all, we see the prodigal's demand. He comes and he says, give me. 
But next we see the prodigal's departure. Notice in verse 13, And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. Not many days after. No doubt when he came to his father and he said, Give me, he already had his mind made up. He already had his plans of where he wanted to be. He just needed the money to get there. And so not many days after, there was a little bit of time between when he got the inheritance and when he took his journey. There was just enough time for him to turn that property and that livestock into cash. And as soon as he had the cash, he was off and running. He was off to the far country. He made his departure. He left his family. He left his home. And he took his journey. We look at this young man's departure. Think about how heartbreaking it must have been for this father to see his son heading off into the world. The father knows what's waiting. The father knows what's going to happen. And yet the father can't prevent it. The father can't stop it. All the father can do is stand back and watch it happen and hope that his son lives long enough to realize his error and comes home. The father had no reason to believe that that would happen. It was hoping against hope that perhaps this boy could yet be saved. That's his departure. But now let's take a look at his destination. Notice that he took his journey into a far country. We don't often think about what the far country represented. But any Jew would have known exactly what Jesus had in mind. The far country was Gentile country. It was country where God was not worshipped. It was country where pagan passions prevailed. It was country where people lived in a very different way. It was a country where people engaged in the lust of the flesh. In Romans chapter 1, we read about the Gentiles and we read about their corruption and we read about the fact that they became so corrupt that God gave them up. We read the same thing in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 3. That's the country that's under consideration here. And that's where this young man wants to go. Now, why does this young man want to go to that country? Because that's the way this young man wants to live. I know that because when he gets there, that's exactly what he does. It's interesting that the elder brother will later say of him that he, he wasted his father's living, his father's inheritance on harlots. Now, I don't know whether that was true or not, but it seems to fit the story. And it seems to fit the kind of living that this young man would be involved in. So he goes to the far country that he might engage in those things. You remember in the Old Testament, the book of Jonah, that we read a story of a man who did much the same. There was a man, a prophet, by the name of Jonah, and God had commanded that prophet to do certain things. But the prophet didn't want to do that. And so the prophet boarded a ship headed for Tarshish, headed for as far away from his father as he could possibly go. That's the prodigal of this parable. He wants to be as far from his father as he can possibly be. But now let's talk about the prodigal's dereliction. Think about the story and take a look at what is said about him. It says he took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance. We think about the term prodigal and the term prodigal carries with it the idea of wasteful. One who takes resources and wastes them. One who is excessive with the resources that they have. And that was true of this young man. He wasted his inheritance. He wasted his father's life. Now, the idea of wasted in this text is the idea of winnowing wheat. If you know anything about wheat and how wheat was threshed, then you know that the, the wheat was thrown up into the air. The chaff was lighter than the wheat. The wheat fell back to the threshing floor, but the chaff was blown away by the winds. Well, that's the way that it happened with this young man's substance or inheritance. It's as if he cast it up and it was blown away. It was winnowed away. It is the idea of scattering seed by use of the wind. 
You throw the seed up in the wind and you let the wind scatter the seed everywhere. That's what this young man did with the inheritance that he had been given. Now, what kind of seed was this young man sowing? He was sowing wild oats. And that's, of course, what he would read. Galatians chapter 6 and verses 7 and 8. But think about how much this young man must have had when he left home. And in a short time, he has nothing. But a great lesson there is in this for our society today, who has so much, and yet it can come to so little. Think about what Solomon said about this in Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 5. He says, For riches certainly make themselves wings and fly away as eagles toward heaven. Money does seem to have wings, doesn't it? It's here one moment and it's gone the next. It's the idea of, of winnowing. You have all of this and yet it blows away and it comes to nothing. That's what happened to this young man's wealth. Think about Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verses 11 and 12 where Solomon says when goods are increased, there are also increased those that eat them. Have you ever noticed that the more money you make, the more things are increased that eat that money, whatever it is? You think about what you made when you first got married, when you got your first job, and you think about what you're making today. And you think about how you never envisioned, you never imagined that you would be at this level, that you'd be making this amount of money, and yet, what has happened? The more and more you've made, the more and more has been increased that eats that wealth as well. Solomon said that, and it holds true. Think about this young man. Think about how that when he got this inheritance and he gets to the far country, he's surrounded by people. He has people all around him. There are those increased that are going to eat up this substance for him. But when the substance is gone, they also will be gone, and there would be no man who would help him in Luke chapter 15 and verse 16. But now let's think about the prodigal's debauchery. Uh, we've seen his demand, give me. We've seen his departure, he takes his journey. Uh, we, we have seen his destination, the far country. We've seen his dereliction as he wastes his substance. But notice his debauchery. He wastes his substance with riotous living. Riotous living literally is living without restraint. It is living without any rules. It is living without any standards. It's just living. When we think about what's being talked about, you may want to consider 1 Peter chapter 4. Peter will talk about those who were living in that way, and they were Gentiles, the very type of uh, person that we're talking about in Luke chapter 15, the far country. These are the kind of people that live there. And here is, here is Peter talking about those kinds of people, talking about the Gentiles. He says in verse 3, For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot. The excess of riot that Peter's talking about is riotous living. Now, what does it mean that he wasted his substance with riotous living? Look at the things that Peter talks about. Lasciviousness, the unchaste handling of males and females, indecent bodily movements. He talks about lust, excess of wine. He even uses the word excess, which is what we talked about with riotous living. It's excessive living. Here is the excess of wine. Excess goes with wine. Revelings. These, these are the drunken parties. The banquetings also would involve the same. The abominable idolatries. A big part of idolatry was fornication and uncleanness. That's what's involved in this excessive kind of lifestyle. That's what it means that the prodigal was engaged in riotous living. He was living without restraint. He was living without rules. He was living without standards. You think about how many people in our world live their lives that way. They live their lives to excess. No rules. Everything they do is to excess. What a shame that is. 
You know, one of the things that we think about when we think about him wasting his, his living and the excess connected with that, we think about what the elder brother said of him. The elder brother said that he wasted it with harlots. That would fit hand in hand with what riotous living is. I don't know whether or not that's how he spent his money, but at least it fits the elder brother's description of that. That's the kind of living that we're talking about. But then we see the prodigal's destitution. Notice in Luke chapter 15 as we continue to go verse by verse and notice what took place. Notice it says in verse 14, And when he had spent all. I'm convinced that when the prodigal left home, he left home with his pockets jammed with cash. His wallet was full. He had plenty of money and no doubt he thought that money would last forever. He thought as the rich farmer did in Luke chapter 12. You remember the rich farmer that had such an abundant harvest? He said, I have goods laid up for many years. I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry. This prodigal son said, I have enough cash to last for many years. I'm going to eat, I'm going to drink, I'm going to be married. I'm a young man, but I'm going to go ahead and retire. And I'm going to live off of this and enjoy this. He didn't realize that it would eventually, and in fact very quickly, come to an end. Riotous living is expensive living. It really is. Smoking is an expensive habit. Drinking alcohol is an expensive habit. Have you ever stood behind someone in line as they were buying beer or some other type of alcohol? Have you ever, in looking at a restaurant menu or been in a restaurant and seen the prices associated with that? And you think, riotous living is expensive living. It's expensive to live that way. It's physically expensive to live that way, no question about it. Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 17, Solomon wrote, He that loveth pleasure shall be a poor man. He that loveth wine and oil shall not be rich. How many rich winos are there? If you're rich when you start the habit, you're very seldom rich when you finish the habit. It's expensive. Proverbs 23 and verse 21 says, For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty. It's physically expensive to engage in riotous living. But that's not the greatest expense associated with it. There are societal expenses connected with it. You think about the expense that our community, that our state, that our nation pays for riotous living. You think about the price tag that's associated with that. And then to think that our government promotes much of it. Our government legalizes gambling. And then has to pay for all the costs associated with that. Our government legalized alcohol. Now we're paying all the costs associated with that. And on and on we could go with that type of riotous living and the costs associated with it. But you know there are emotional costs associated with it too. You think about the people whose lives are ruined because of riotous living. Who never will ever be the same again. I'm not saying they can't be forgiven. I'm not saying that they can't be saved. I think they can. Sometimes there are scars left behind that never go away. Riotous living is expensive living because it leaves things behind that we just can't fix. You think about the people today who have destroyed their health, they've destroyed their marriages, they've destroyed their families, they've lost whatever house or car that they had because of riotous living. Oh, the cost. Think about the emotional cost of knowing this was mine and here's what I did with it. 
Think about as well the spiritual and the eternal cost connected with righteous living. What is a man profited? The Bible says if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul, Matthew 16 and verse 26, and yet there are people that are losing their soul because of righteous living. What a cost. What a cost. To think about what they have and what they give up to live that way. The prodigal did that and when he had spent all. Then we see the prodigal's danger, if you look at verse 14. When he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land. Notice the connection between these two. He spends everything, and almost at the very end, when he spends his last dollar, a famine sets in. And he's in extreme danger. He's in extreme danger because he doesn't have anything. And not only has hard times come for him, but hard times have come for the land that he's in. And so even when people, even if they were good, good good-natured people, even if they were loving and caring people, now what little they have, they're holding back because they've got to take care of themselves. They don't have to share with you. That's the position that he's in. It's a very dangerous position. You know, when the prodigal son left home, he didn't envision running out of money, nor did he envision being in a land that would be suffering from a famine. And even if he had envisioned that, he didn't envision this kind of a famine. The text says it was a mighty famine, which means that it wasn't your average run-of-the-mill, slowed-down economy. But rather, things hit bottom. You know, we talk about people preparing for a rainy day. He didn't prepare for a rainy day. He didn't prepare for a day when it didn't rain either. And likely that was the cause of this famine, no rain. He didn't prepare for that. He thought that the grass was greener in the far country, but he didn't see the day when it would be brown and dead. didn't make preparation for it. And it caught him unprepared. And he found himself in very, very serious danger. You know, he would have been in danger even if he had been in the land of Israel. Famines hit everyone hard. But if he had been in the land of Israel, there were certain provisions that were made for the poor and for the stranger with the corners of the fields and other rules and other preparations. But he wasn't in the land of Israel. He was in Gentile country. And the Gentiles didn't make any such provision for the poor or for the strangers. It was every man for himself. And this man was in a very difficult position. In fact, he was in a position where it was even hard to find a job. He's going to struggle to even find a way to make a living, to make a difference. Let's talk about the prodigal's desperation. If you look at verse 15, it says, He went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. I want you to think about the desperation that this young man is in. His money's gone. There's a famine in the land. The earth has dried up along with it. The jobs have dried up. And so the text says that he went and joined himself. The word joined there is a very descriptive word. It means he went and glued himself to a citizen in that country. Here's a young man, his pockets are empty, his belly is empty, he can't find a job, and so he finds a wealthy man, and he sticks to that man like glue. Everywhere that man goes, he goes. Every day he's at that man's property. Every day he's following that man around. You have anything for me to do? You need any help with this? You need any help with that? Every day, every day, he's pressuring this man, I need a job. The word citizen here, most believe that it has a reference to Roman citizenship, which means that this man was a wealthy landowner. This was a privileged person. He was a Gentile, but he he had done well. And this young man saw his big estate, and this young man latched on to him, and he wouldn't go away. I remember one time we had a man who slept outside of the church building. He wasn't going away. So he got a bus ticket somewhere. He eventually got his bus ticket. But he stuck to us like glue. I'm going to be here. I'm going to... 
What kind of advertisement is that for a congregation? Somebody sleeping on the doorstep. You won't help that man? You won't do anything for him? His prodigal son, he sticks to this man. He's there with him. He's his shadow every day, asking him for some work. And finally, this man gives him a job. This prodigal didn't want to take a job to begin with. And he certainly didn't want to take this job. But it shows how desperate he was that he would take not only a job, but that he would take this job. That he would take the job of slopping hogs. That's his job. And he takes this job. When we think about him taking this job, we think about the fact that beggars can't be choosers. MacArthur says that those who took care of swine were those who had no skills whatsoever. It didn't take any skills to feed pigs. So these were unskilled workers. This young man likely, being from the family that he was from, had many skills. But he's in a job that doesn't require any skills at all. It was a job that was generally reserved for those who were mentally deficient or socially deficient. It was reserved for those who mentally could not hold a job. Didn't take any thinking, didn't require any thought, didn't require uh, any reasoning to have this job. It's the kind of person that filled this position. This was for a person who couldn't get along with people, so you stuck him out with the pigs. That's what this job was. Now this young man evidently was a man who, who had plenty of skills. He was a man from a good family. He was a man who had all the potential in the world. But he's in a dead-end job. Here's a man who has been the life of the party. He has been surrounded by friends. But now he's a social outcast. Nobody's around him. That's where this young man was at this point in his life. There could not have been a more detestable job for a Jewish boy than this job. It was the only job he could find. And evidently, it did not pay very much. For we find that he reached the point to where he began to see the pigs as being in a better position than he was in. Because they had something to eat and he didn't. Evidently, his pay was not very much. I want you to think about this young man, day by day, stomping around in the muck and in the mire, slopping these hogs. As he steps in that muck and that mire, the stench is overwhelming. No doubt after some time he doesn't notice it anymore. It's his daily place of work. Can you imagine the first days on the job? He still had some of the clothing he left home with, some of the clothing he had purchased perhaps through the money that he had. Now here he is stomping through the muck and the mire. Can you imagine that and, and that splashing up? It gets in his eyes. It gets in his mouth. <coughs> Imagine it caked on his hands, underneath his fingernails. It's caked on his clothes. Day by day, as he slopped those hogs, he was being shown a picture of who he had become. He was wallowing in the mire of sin in the same way that those pigs were wallowing in this mire. He had been feasting on slop in the same way that they were. He had given over to the same base appetites that were theirs. What a waste of his life. And day by day, he had to come to grips with that. What if the story had ended here? I'm convinced that the Pharisees would have been glad for the story to end here. After all, that's what this boy deserves. How dare he go to his father and say that? How dare he go into the far country and do that? He's in the pig pen, that's where he belongs. 
end the story there. But our Lord and Savior couldn't end the story there. Because our Lord and Savior didn't want that boy in the pig pen. Our Lord and Savior wanted that boy back in the Father's house. And he couldn't end the story till he was there. I don't know where you are this morning. It may very well be that you're in the pig pen this morning. And there are some people who are, who are fully satisfied in your being there. There are some people who would say, you deserve to be there. You've made foolish choices. You've done dumb things. You're exactly where you ought to be. But our Lord and Savior isn't saying that. Our Lord and Savior is saying, I don't want you to be in that pig pen. I want you out of that pig pen. I want you safe at home again. I want you to come to yourself. I want you to realize where you are. I want you to realize where you've done. I want you to change your mind. And I want you to come home. That's where I want you to be. And that's where He's inviting you to be this morning. Have you reached the point to where you're ready to come home? We're going to talk about that tonight. So if you're not there this morning, maybe you'll be there tonight. Go home and read the rest of the story. Come back tonight and we'll talk about where this young man eventually gets to. Where you need to get to. If you're not a Christian this morning, you're in the mire of sin. I don't know how long you've been there. I don't know how many years you've spent in vanity and pride. But you're there this morning. The Lord doesn't want you to be there, though. The Lord wants you to leave that mire of sin. The Lord wants you to be washed. He wants you to be cleansed. And He never wants you to go back to wallowing that mire again. Isn't it interesting that later in 1 Peter, Peter will talk about the erring child of God as going back to wallowing in the mire? He uses this very picture of that. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Will you repent of your sins, make the good confession, be immersed in water for the remission of your sins? If you'll do those things, then you'll become a child of God. But then is required of you faithful living. And if you should go into the far country, and you should engage in that which is a violation of your Father's will, there will be the need for you to change your mind through changing your mind because you're sorry for the way you're living, there will come about a change of life. You can be restored again to your Father's house. 1 John 1, 7-9 says that if we confess our faults, He's faithful and just to forgive us. Are you willing to do that this morning? If so, come as we stand and as we sing. Gentle voice of Jesus, fall.